please go ahead. Okay, so um, uh, thank you members for joining us today. We're going to have a look at some of the GIS applications in planning that we have within um, the scope of ArcGIS especially. And um, my name is Latumam Kohe, and I hope this session will be as impactful to you um, even as you do your work as planners. So the agenda of this, the agenda of this um, engagement is to look at the overview of what the GIS systems are and how you can be able to bring them to the various initiatives that we have in terms of GIS and planning. And then we'll have a look at the different applications for planning in ArcGIS. And then um, we'll have a Q&A session, which will now lead us to the next step, as Byron mentioned. We'll have other sessions that you'll be able to actively interact with the products and actively um, work with the products and engage with them using your own data or local data that can now be um, utilized to show you and appreciate um, how effective the systems are. So to start us off, um, why do we need GIS for planning? And um, definitely the main reason is because cities are complex and with the complexity and dynamic nature of these cities, cities need to attract investment one. Um, we need to be able to manage housing affordability, being able to manage and improve economic resiliency, and at the same time, be able to meet our sustainability goals. If it's Nairobi, if it's Kisumu, if it's Mombasa, they have different um, sustainability goals. So how do we ensure that we can use technology to then um, improve that or to then engage with the data that we have and um, use that data to influence the development plans and the master plans. So geographic information systems um, is one of the tools that can be able to provide us with the building blocks for better planning of our cities and towns and better management of our residential areas, our communities, our infrastructure. And in the course of our training for the next couple of months, um, the one in July, the one in September, we're going to look at a number of applications that we can work with as planners to ensure that our workflows one and the methods that we use are able to achieve all the goals, the sustainability goals, the development goals that have been set for the different cities that you're in. And this will then in turn help us to solve some of the challenges that our cities face from urban sprawl to um, pollution. And all this is going to be tackled over the next few, the next few courses. So um, what makes the GIS pattern so interesting and compelling, especially for planning, is that it's much easier to use it's more accessible and it's interconnected. And interconnection means multiple people, multiple departments can be able to use the same information that is hosted within the same system to then do their work. And there's a pattern we are currently seeing in other countries, even in Kenya, different organizations where different entities um, KIP can be one of those entities, as an example, are contributing to the national um, geospatial infrastructure. And how they do this is by providing foundational content, content from statistical data, infrastructure data, data that includes housing and building information, health and human services, regulations and policies, which are very key when it comes to planning. So we have this um, infrastructure or this system that allows us to be able to host all this content. And it is with this content that a big role is going to be played in ensuring proper planning is achieved. And more importantly, that this foundational content is consumed across different departments. So if you're talking about people from the transport sector, we have planners in the transport sector, we have planners in the housing sector, we have planners in um, government. So how do you ensure that they are all able to play a key role in um, building and working with the same database and then use this database to then manipulate if it's planning, if it's creating master plans, if it's coming up with um, residential development plans, how do you ensure that they're doing it with already um, uh, with an already um, predetermined landscape, which is now the database that can be used and shared across departments, across organizations, and even across communities if uh, community engagement is um, is required. So this then brings us to 
what ArcGIS envisions when we're looking at planning. And in planning, we're looking at both city and regional planning in general. Um, when you look at my screen, you realize we have the geospatial cloud that is tied to various components. Uh, we have collected, integrate, we have analyzed, we have produced, and we finally have shared. So as planners, we use a lot of data that is in different formats, data that has been stored and hosted in different formats, from the basic structured and unstructured tabular data, which may or may not have the geospatial component, to beam data that we can get from architects and engineers and all this is critical to how we do our work or to shape files that we store in folders and in disks and that will form a basis of what we collect and integrate into the geospatial system. And when we look at analysis, um, we want to see how an area is affected. If we want to build a three-story building, can we see how um, the line of sight from the ground is going to affect um, the development of that building? Can we see the shadow analysis of these different um, buildings or these different infrastructure that you're trying to develop? And that is very key. When it comes to land use, we are trying to ensure 50% is given to um, probably public land, then how do we visualize the 50% on a map? These are some of the capabilities that ArcGIS allows us to be able to visualize. And you can use either the desktop applications like ArcGIS Pro, or you can utilize the ArcGIS online resources to do the same thing. Just do brief analysis and then visualize your results in graphs, visualize your results on maps, and then um, that will form a basis for your policies and will form a basis for your developments. We finally have produce, which is where now we are working with the different applications that may be a result of your analysis or the different dashboards that may be a result of your analysis. You'll realize here it's not necessary for someone to have GIS background to be able to consume this content. Uh, management, people in management, people um, in communities who are keen on the developments that are happening within their communities can be able to interact with some of these products if it's the dashboards to be able to visualize the numbers, to be able to look at the maps, to be able to look at the key uh, performance in um, initiatives that you're looking at, then you can have them linked or attached to the dashboards and then they can be able to consume that in their phones as applications or even on their desktops as applications as well. And then there's the, all this content, the ones you've collected, the ones you've analyzed and the products that you come up with can be shared as open data. And the sharing is where everyone is able to benefit from the work that you do as planners across board. If you're looking at urban planning, community community planning, the environmental planners, the planners and environmentalists who are not really technical but are still consuming the data that you're working with, the executives, the policy makers, keep in general, you're the people who influence the policies that come up with, you can consume this data and actually utilize it to then form a basis of um, the different policies, of the different methodologies and the workflows that will greatly impact the sustainable goals that we're trying to achieve in general. So in GIS, we have different initiatives that as uh, ESRI we've tried to incorporate when it comes to planning. And it is through these different initiatives that we have different softwares that will allow you to achieve them. One of these initiatives is um, current community planning. Now, the reason for this is um, planners usually find themselves immersed in many challenges that face local governments, for example. And when you have advanced tools that will help you to form solutions to solve these um, current community challenges, then it will be very key to influence how you go about your work. Now, GIS adds the element of location into each of the workflows that you have. It will modify the updated manuals that we use normally. It will make sense of vast amounts of information. If you're talking about population, you want to find out where um, people mostly living, then we can look at such large amounts of population, then the system can consume this and break it down for us so that we're able to understand and break down the different information in a way that we can consume it and break it down better for planning. Now, tasks like public notification, um, you want to notify people of um, 
uh, change of use probably you want to notify people of um, road uh, development plans then how do we do that the system can allow us to be able to do that and data that um is then gathered or data that is then collected can be consumed in web applications, which can produce comprehensive information for visualization. If you want to measure distances for analyze proposed developments, then you can do that when you're looking at current community development. Now, um, being able to analyze proposed development is basically being able to look at a plan in 2D and 3D in a secure environment to allow you or empower you to be able to do urban and regional planning better as the planning people or the people within the planning space. Now you can be able to review, as I mentioned, tools or things like the lines of sight, being able to look at the shadow impact. If you're building a 40 story building, how will that impact the shadow around that area? Being able to analyze the effect of proposed zoning plans, for example, the proposed of land use changes, for example, and ensure that every decision, every action that we make at the end of the day as the planners is going to be driven by data that we have at hand and not just by guesswork. And then when we look at being able to streamline or permitting the review processes or the workflows that go when we are reviewing um, the different proposals, you get to have a more um, streamlined and secure workflow that will allow you to um, look at the proposed land developments, uh, proposed rezoning develop, uh, plans, proposed site reviews, and all these other things, and being able to integrate GIS into your permitting systems so that you're able to provide that location intelligence, generate more value from existing systems. So um, imagine being able to, maybe there's a place that has been sectioned for residential um, development only, but you have someone who's trying to propose and um, that they do a uh, commercial uh, development there. As the system will be able to tell you and also notify them that this place is purely secluded for um, residential development, which is very key because then you get to remove those um, unnecessary um, workflows that you necessarily Necessarily, you don't need to go into to always check and verify that this person is actually proposing the right thing at the right place. And then we have another initiative for long range planning. And when I say long range planning, I mean long term planning. So uh, in this case, we're looking at planners have having the obligation to create a path for sustainable and e equitable development, which will lead to opportunities for every resident. If it's in Nairobi, if it's in Mombasa, if it's in Nakuru, being able to have those equitable opportunities. Now to achieve this, it is very essential that planners understand and not only understand, but get to incorporate and analyze the location and make it the focal point for their long-term planning. So practices such as um, geodesign, will have a very long embrace when you're using location intelligence based to um, be able to find the right balance between either the built and natural environment so that we're not exhausting the natural environment at the expense of um, at the expense of just building or ensuring that people have homes then are you taking care of the natural environment at the same time? So that is key. And then just being able to ensure that we approach sustainability and equity and public input, which is now the community input in a very comprehensive way, will also be very important. I saw someone raise their hand. Let me finish this point and then I can give you a chance to ask your question or you could just type your question in the chat box and then we can um, respond to it. So there are a number of... Um, elements that we look at when you're talking about long-term planning. And one of them is being able to evaluate your build-out analysis in 3D. And the 3D perspective is very key because you're able to see how the developments you're looking at will affect the existing ecosystems in a 3D perspective. If it's um, a building, how will that impact the road networks? How will that impact to the natural ecosystem? And that is very important when you're trying to visualize and actually understand in the perspective of um, 3D. Then we have been able to generate environmental impact analysis, which is just being able to understand, being able to analyze, and not only analyze, but also report 
on the environmental impact um, of the proposed developments and changes either in land use or in the plants. And these maps can be shared, yeah? So once you create something or once you've um, been able to look at the environmental impact, you can share this with either the administrators, with the stakeholders who actually do the approvals across different um, applications or across the ActJS online accounts that you will be having. And then we have being able to establish data planning and uh, data and planning standards. And in this case, we are looking at being able to standardize how data is used across board, that we are all working with the same um, platform um, of data. You're not using data that was used 10 years ago when we have more updated data. So just being able to set those standards and being able to um, regulate how these plans and how this information is utilized across the different entities is also um, very important. We have another initiative, um, which is resilience planning. And um, as planners, your responsibility is to prepare for and also mitigate challenges that can come from either acute shocks, if it's um, earthquakes or chronic stresses. So when we're looking at things like um, the COVID-19 um, pandemic that we had recently. So for you, it's to plan and prepare for this. If you're talking about hospitals, how many hospitals do we have in an area? Do these hospitals have the right resources? Do these hospitals have the right amount of um, land, for example, to ensure that even if it's development for the next five years, to plan for these stresses that may come, are they ready for this? And incorporating resilient strategies, resilient regulations will help in designing and um, will help in ensuring that we are able to deal with the acute challenges as they come and as they impact the different cities. So um, the, the convergence of um, many of the factors that greatly impact us, one of them being natural disasters, homelessness, for example, um, will affect the community's potential to prosper and grow. And um, since location is a factor in every aspect when it comes to resilience planning, GIS really helps us to be able to develop and develop for these strategies to ensure that we are able to provide tools that not only the local government, but the private sector can use to create and analyze their designs and also collaborate with their stakeholders. Here we also have a number of things that you can be able to look into. For example, being able to access conservation and preservation activities, being able to support economic sustainability, and also being able to promote social equity and um, healthy communities, um, ensuring that everyone has access to at least a hospital, that everyone has access to at least a school in their community or in their neighborhood. So these are some of the things that you can look at when you're looking at resilience planning. And for this, you get to also interact with tools like ArcGIS Insights, ArcGIS um, Pro, ArcGIS Online, and all this will be able to just form a basis for you to then um, do all these activities. The final um, initiative we'll be looking at is citizen engagement. We have more. I'll share a link after this for you to be able to look at the rest. But for citizen engagement, we're looking at um, users like designers, urban designers, urban planners and developers, you're able to test proposed variances and find the maximum potential. You get to gather uh, feedback from communities. You get to validate proposals against the regulatory codes that you set. And this will allow for um, easy understanding of the different initiatives that you're trying to do in communities. Citizen engagement is key, especially if it's something that impacts them. So being able to bring them on board using applications, using surveys, you can give out survey one to three forms for them to fill in and give you feedback. Um, if you're trying to find out the effect of um, maybe a pandemic in a particular area, you can ask for feedback and actually track the um track how this impact is across the region or across the town. And then that will build onto the policies that you'll create towards that um, pandemic or the policies that you'll create to ensure that the public is, um, is aware of the trends that are going on. Now for this, we have 
three pillars that form citizen engagement. And one of them is being able to inform um, the public about priority initiatives. So we are building a hospital. Can we get feedback from the public? Being able to create a destination for the initiatives. Where can they go to see the progress of the works that you're doing? Is it through a story map, for example? Is it by um, creating a website where every information about this initiative is hosted and they can go there and consume it and actually look at it. And then um, being able to post notifications and monitor opinions. So you post something out and then through a dashboard, you're able to see how many people are for this thing or not against it, or how many people have different opinions across to then build or to then feed into your policies, feed into the workflows that you're intending to carry out. Now, today, our main area of focus was to look at the geoinformation technology applications that then form um, what you do as planners. And um, when you're looking at being able to plan and design, we have tools like ArcGIS Urban, which allow you to do um, scenario planning with different um, ideas, different um, forms, which then feeds from the data that you may have. Remember, I talked about being able to work with data that is already existing, infrastructure data, housing and building data that can be put into the system for ArcGIS Urban, and then we will use that to form a basis for residential planning, master planning, and all uh, the other things that you do. We have tools like ArcGIS City Engine as well, which allow you to then bring that 3D perspective into your workflows as well. And the most important or the most used, which is ArcGIS Pro. And ArcGIS Pro is a desktop application that will allow you to do your mapping and visualization activities, your analysis activities on the desktop, and then publish this to your accounts in ArcGIS Online for consumption with either other departments or other people. And then um, when we look at when we look at um, being able to visualize, now here we have tools like ArcGIS dashboards and insights. So you get to look at the KPIs that you set, if it's uh, health, then how many people have been affected by malaria in January? Can we have this on a dashboard? If it's um, the roads, we are trying to see how many roads are damaged in Nairobi at the moment. Can we see that in a dashboard? So you can have different KPIs and those KPIs can then be visualized on a dashboard and analyzed in insights and these results can be shared um, to the different teams that are relevant or the different stakeholders who are relevant to that particular activity. Now, when we have, uh, when we come to data collection, you work with a lot of data. It is data that drives the planning that you have to do. So ArcGIS offers a number of tools that can assist us to do this. We have ArcGIS Film Maps, which is a map-centric kind of data collection tool. And by map-centric, I mean you get to collect data on a map. And then um, we have ArcGIS Survey 123, and this is a more form-centric um, kind of data collection tool. So think of this in the sense of um, you're collecting data on forms but you're also integrating it into the system. So whatever data is being collected is actively updated to our system. And then we are able to see um, in general what is happening around us. And then finally, the citizen and community engagement um, tools. Survey123, as I mentioned, is one of them. Can we get um, feedback from the community? Then we can use this. Um, and embed it on websites so that people are able to actually interact with us, give us feedback. We have community analysts as well. We have ArcGIS Story Maps, and finally, ArcGIS Hub. So today, I'll, today I'll be showing you a demo on two of, on two of our softwares. Give me one minute. Um, I hope you can see my screen. So um, this is basically what ArcGIS Pro is. 
It's a desktop application that allows us to be able to consume our data in different formats. And you can see here, I have a map that is able to show me the land use for Langata. And um, you can see we have the different um, colors that represent different land use types. And you can change this. It allows you, the system allows you to be able to change and manipulate this depending on the different regulations that we have. I know we have different colors that symbolize different things in the various regions that we are in. So just being able to pick what works for you and then um, changing that as you move along is going to really help. And then we have tools that allow us to do a, a number of uh, analysis. So maybe I can start with the 3D analyst tool, which can really work for us as planners, being able to visualize um, whatever activities we're doing. If it's the uh, development plans, can you visualize it in 3D? looking at the proximity analysis, um, checking the intersections, doing point clouds. This is very, very important. And then we have a tool that allows us to be able to do indoor mapping. So for example, um, you want to map a university and allow students to know um, where the lecture halls are, to know where the um, offices are. So you can use the tools that are found within the indoor space to be able to do that, create pathways and allow them to um, consume the results that you have in applications that they can then um, utilize. Mm -hmm. And then we have a tool for spatial analysis. So just being able to do very basic things like um, being able to do very basic things like um, the proximity analysis, buffering, um, then that you can get to do it from this. Now I'd like to mention that in the course of um, the next sessions that we have, you'll get to interact with most of these tools. We allow you to um, access our training portal and then um, we'll get to interact with most of the tools that I've mentioned. So don't worry about that, we'll get to utilize them later on. And then um, once you have something as simple as this or the land parcels, then you can get to decide what are the KPIs that you are intending to use. And in this case, when you're talking about um, the KPIs, we can look at the attribute table. So we can look at the attribute table and maybe let me just open it. So we probably want to look at um, the acreage of each parcel. Then we can we can see we can see the plot numbers, we can see the acreage, and it will all depend on what your intention is um, for actually doing this. Now, I mentioned being able to work with data from multiple multiple sources and data in different formats. This data is hosted in uh, the databases. So a database can host or a database can have every information that you want to utilize. If it's the land use um, data, if it's the parcels, if it's the buildings, building footprint as they are currently, then you can have that posted uh, within one database, which can then be shared with multiple um, people in an organization or published online for people to then utilize there. Now, once you have something similar to this, we can then publish it and we'll be publishing it to ArcGIS Online. So, we'll be publishing it to ArcGIS Online. Give me one minute. Let me open up my ArcGIS Online. If you have any questions kindly, just keep on um, posting them on the chat. Someone will, will be getting to them shortly. So once, uh, once you've published your content from ArcGIS Pro, then you get to have them posted in your ArcGIS online, which is this, and you can share them all post them here either in folders as I've done in mine, or you can even go ahead and create groups. And in these groups, then you get to add members if it's in 
Um, we can have an account probably for KIP. So with KIP, we can have groups in different regions and then people get to join those groups and consume data that is hosted within their different regions in this group. So which is going to work very well when you're talking about working with data that is the same across board. And then um, you can work with that data to then um, influence how you plan, to influence how you create your master plans, how you decide um, the developments for the different um, lands. If it's a change of use, can you look at where it is located? What is the use for that particular zone? And then allow or dismiss a development proposal um, as it comes. Uh, I also wanted to show you another tool that we have, which is ArcGIS Urban. So ArcGIS Urban allows us to be able to develop in a scenario based kind of way. So each of us can have different ideas in mind when it comes to planning probably Kisumu for residential um, development. So how do we ensure that we are doing this, but we have different perspectives. So in this case, we can have a plan like this. Uh, this is an example. And uh, with this, you can have, you, you can see that I already have pre-existing pre -existing buildings, which comes with a software. So you don't necessarily need to know where the building footprint currently exists. It is automatically um, added onto your plan as you're developing. And then you get to add your land developments uh, or your parcels. And then now you get to develop and decide what you're building across um, this particular area. So for example, um, you can see here we have different land use types listed and the residential areas for uh, very small uh, families are here. We have the medical uh, hospitals given, we have the office space, we have the commercial space. So each of these colors um, will give you an idea of what exactly, um, what exactly does each color symbolize and how does it affect. And then I mentioned it being scenario based. So maybe let me switch between this plan and we have another plan here. We'll give it a few seconds. Yeah, so you can see that there's a change and in this change, um, some land has been left vacant, but we have some that has been allocated to uh, the hospital, we have some that has been allocated to mixed use, some that has been given purely for commercial and others that have been given purely for residential. So this gives you a perspective and these are just two, but someone else can come up, we can be working on the same project together, someone else can come up and add a scenario and change the perspective that I've given here and actually give it something different for us to all benefit from the different perspectives that we can have as um, planners in different departments and in different counties. So that concludes my, uh, my presentation for the slide and the demo. So I'd like to give this back to Victor or Byron. And then if you have any questions, um, kindly ask as I look at the ones that are in the chat. <laughs> 